Welcome back to the Dot Citizen Podcast. I'm your host, Chrisella Herzog. And I'm Zachary Stickney. In this episode, we're continuing our dive into election security through a conversation with Harry Hursty. Harry is one of the world's leading experts in election security, and a lot of our understanding of vulnerabilities in election infrastructure is due to his research. He is the founding partner of Nordic Innovation Labs and one of the co-founders of the Voting Machine Hacking Village at DEF CON. Now, before we jump into the interview with Harry, I wanted to give you a quick explanation on DEF CON. DEF CON is one of the world's largest hacker conventions, with attendees ranging from computer security professionals and researchers to journalists to employees of government agencies like the NSA and the FBI. This is a crowd that has had concerns about the security of elections infrastructure and elections machines for a long time. After the 2016 election, when this concern reached the general public with more urgency, DEF CON announced that the 2017 conference would include a voting machine hacking village. In the voting village, attendees had access to election machines that are in use today, and the goal was to play around with those machines and find the vulnerabilities in their security. And flaws they did find. I wrote about the 2017 report put out by the Voting Village in White Hat Magazine, and I'll include a link to that and the report in the show notes of this episode. So in this episode, we talked to Harry about the Voting Village's 2018 report, including what we should be worried about in the midterms this year and what our conversation around election security needs to look like going forward. We're going to get started with our big, the big question first. After the 2016 election, there were concerns that Russian efforts to influence the election included hacks of ballot systems and vote tallies. So we know that there were efforts to attack state election websites, but those seemed to that they didn't go any farther than probing the website. And all available evidence is that vote tallies were not changed. So what do we need to understand about what happened in 2016 in the context of election security? So first of all, uh, one of the uh, big security concerns we have been flagging out in all of the security studies is that a certain percentage of the voting machines uh, called VREs, the touchscreen voting machines, they are not only unauditable, uh, you cannot audit the results at all, but even more so, those machines have no capability of preserving forensic logs. So by saying a, uh, if, if, if you want to be a, a, uh, a little bit in a, in a paranoid side of the, of, the, of the fact, you can say, well, these machines really cannot preserve evidence, and if a capable hacker is attacking those machines, which are unauditable, uh, you will not see any evidence that the tallies were ever changed because those machines are not capable of preserving such tallies, mm-hmm. such uh, forensic logs or log entries. That being said, uh, when we look what is publicly known now about a, uh, a uh, nation state actors, uh, threat actors in 2016 election. The ongoing story was uh, mainly attacks towards the backend systems, backend networks, etc. So if you follow that path, then uh, one of the more vulnerable uh, sites of, of that are voter databases, voter rolls, e-poll book systems, and all the infrastructure which is required to uh, verify the eligibility to vote and, and, and all that information. So that really is is the area which is vulnerable. And uh, if you look, what is the difference between 2016 and 2018? One of the major changes is that there has been a nationwide uh, rollout of electronic poll book systems, uh, especially in the larger jurisdictions. Now these systems don't have any federal level recommended standards or any federal level certification. The states might have their own certification process or might not have. Basically, that those devices don't have any set security standards which are, you know, uniform over the, over the, over the all states. So it is a new technology which is 
coming and which has been deployed, uh, which has a which the which have not been part of any other security studies. Uh, we had one of those machines in 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 Defcon. We have that, but it's really it's really a wild west and a black box. Uh, nobody knows really what uh, what are the real end game security implications of that rollout. I mean, to follow up on that, uh, one of the quotes we read in the Voting Village report stated that for the U.S. election system, the challenges at hand are much larger than just software bugs. There are fundamental design issues to sort out and fix. The innovation inherent in this kind of exercise can be of immeasurable impact. And so is innovation like that happening with the companies that build election equipment? We know that Congress has been unwilling to release new funds for election security, but are there changes that are happening even without that funding? I I see very little uh, changes in that area. Uh, it's it's really the when 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 the report what is what the report is referring is uh, a, the infrastructure which is right in place having a far, a hardware software design issues. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, uh, even in the, when you look at the newer machines, there are new initiatives, uh, for example, adding a mobile phone network capabilities into the voting machines. So mm -hmm. there, there are, if you look at that kind of architecture, actually, I would argue some of the, some of the new changes, uh, we, don't, we haven't audited that, so it's not a, a, as a fact, but, the, but if you think about adding in this time a mobile network wireless capabilities in the voting machines to me that seems a little bit risky yeah. with all the news about ss7 attacks and whatnot so um your quote that zach just asked you about in that report you also mentioned uh bug bounty programs so uh have these types of bug bounty programs been implemented in the election security field yeah. and who is offering these sorts of bug bounties so far if so uh, I have, so best of my knowledge, uh, bug bounty programs have not been implemented in this area. Mm -hmm. I have been speaking with the uh, CEO of uh, Hacker One, and he has been trying to propose, my understanding is he's try, he has been trying to propose a bug bounty program, program into the voting machine area, but I haven't, I haven't seen it. There might be something I don't know, but I haven't seen anything happening in, in that area. I would also like to point out that the, the worst vulnerabilities, many of the worst vulnerabilities we have discovered, they are not bugs. They are design issues and they are, they are feature, unsafe features. Mm -hmm. they, 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 it's very few of those really bad bugs which actually are software bugs and, and, and as such, uh, you know, that's a typical vulnerability source. Great. Yeah, we're actually going to get into a couple of questions about that right now. So, Oh, excellent. Yeah, uh, one of the problems your report mentions in particular is the ESNS M650 scanning and tabulating machine. And apparently there's a problem with the machine not authenticating updates to the device that was reported by the Ohio Secretary of State way back in 2007. And hackers have, have oh. apparently found the same flaw on the same machine just this year in 2018. So what's going on there and why aren't vulnerabilities being fixed even when they're pointed out by credible sources? I. I'm, 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 it's a very great question, and I don't have an answer. And, and so back when 2005, when I started by hacking default freezing fix optical scan machine, the first response to that report by the vendor was to discredit, say it's a magic, so it doesn't work. So after that, Secretary of State California at the time, he ordered a study by University of Berkeley uh, to find out if my hack is real, if it works. And, um, and the uh, report came out and they said, well, the hack is real, it works. And by the way, we found about that another thing, uh, which I didn't find. When, when that and a couple of other reports happened 2005, 2006, we as security community and research, we thought now when these things are exposed, few years and everything is fixed, this is a problem which will be fixed very quickly. Now, fast forward to this day. The same software versions we exposed 2005, they are still in use in many places. 
The vulnerabilities which we in Ohio Secretary of State Everest report, where M650 was one of the machines, those same software versions which we explored, to, not from ESNS, but, but basically from all the vendors, those software versions are still out there, still in use. Mm. There's actually a, uh, I was shocked in one state where uh, they had just recently got the new delivery of voting machines, and the new delivery has the same old versions of software from 2007. Wow. Uh, which were actually, so uh, the, I, I, I really, there are newer versions of some of the software. Uh, some cases, they, the newer versions fix some of these vulnerabilities, sometimes they don't. But there seems to be no upgrade procedure or, or uh, it, it seems to be very uh, seldom when these upgrades are installed. Mm -hmm. For example, the, uh, the default TSX machine, which uh, we used in, uh, in that one uh, as the uh, demonstration, that machine had the newest version uh, available. But we know that at least three versions are still in use uh, nationwide here and there, and including mm -hmm. version which is older than the whole uh, 2007 report. Mm -hmm. uh, so those versions are still out there, and I don't, I, I really don't know. If I don't know what is the licensing terms, and I know what, I don't know which, what, what are the barriers, why mm -hmm. upgrades really don't happen. Interesting. Um, so I want to kind of continue uh, off of Zach's question, focusing on EES and S a little bit more, um, election systems and software. For, with Zach's example, that wasn't the only problem that that company's machines and equipment have had. So for example, in the early 2000s, they were installing a remote access software tool called PC Anywhere on their machines. And in 2006, hackers stole the source code for the software. Symantec didn't admit to the theft until 2012, which is about the same time that security researchers discovered that PC Anywhere would allow an attacker to seize control of a system that had the software installed, and it didn't need uh, authentication or a password to do it. So throughout all of this, ESNS has been stonewalling, and they kind of seem like a worst case example of what's been going on in the election security world. They didn't show up to a congressional hearing and they've dismissed the work of security researchers, including the Voting Village report. So what does this situation tell us more broadly about the state of election security in the United States? So first of all, uh, I, our company is helping a number of secretaries of state number of local jurisdictions as consultants of security, so we do a security review. It's not only ESNS who is installing remote access software. It's mm -hmm. no, not only PC Anywhere, which is used as access software. Also, the real VNC, uh, have seen that installed out in a while. It just gets even worse. Uh, one of the uh, other vendors than ESNS, uh, in their manual, for a local election official, the uh, administrator and super user password, uh, the text says, uh, by the federal regulation, you are going to be asked periodically to change your password. These are the two passwords, change the forth, back and forth between those two. And that's in the manual. Wow. And those like both how. passwords are trivially guessable, just laughable guessable. Mm -hmm. And then later down the road, it's a super user password, and it, in that case, they say when you add add, add one number, so the person uh, is supervisor now supervisor one, then supervisor two. So add oh a number God. right down, which is which is the current number for your password. So oh these are these are these are the manual for election supervisors how to operate their central tabulator. Uh, <laughs> because sometimes. It, 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 if, if everything I have seen in the world uh, with the voting machines, if somebody would try to explain to me everything I have seen, I wouldn't believe it. Mm -hmm. And the reason why we have DEF CON, is DEF CON is not about hacking the machines. It, it's not about proving anything, because we always knew that all the machines we have in the village are hackable. It, it's an educational effort, allowing people to come to see that by themselves, learn the facts by themselves, explore and discover 
And one thing what I really loved in DEFCON is this year we had over 100 election officials, local election officials, who came to the village. And some of them came to hack the machines they use in their jurisdiction. Because this mm -hmm. is the first time when they can, without, you know, license terms and whatnot, they can open the machines and, 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 and find out how they work. But yes, I mean, it's the, the, this whole area uh, and all vendors, I would say, all, all vendors, are, uh, which I'm aware of, and, and, and I'm not aware of if every vendor in, in the United States, in the United States, but the big ones. There is, seems to be complete lack of even basic security uh, understanding, and, 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 and as I said, manuals are saying this is the this is the required control, security control. This is how you bypass it. And I will tell uh, two funny anecdotal stories. Earlier this year, I was in a large jurisdiction in the United States, and uh, I had a conversation with a local election official. And uh, the official told me, don't worry, we are completely unhackable. All, <laughs> all, all our systems are air gas. We use only wireless. I started laughing because I thought this was a brilliant delivery of a joke. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. But then... Other stories, in a number of places, the uh, statewide network is... Uh, the local election officials are, are, are uh, relying on statewide networks and statewide services. And I was in one large jurisdiction, and a guy who is uh, from, the, from the operations comes like, what are you doing? What, what is your point trying to prove these, these um, voting machines to be hackable? Of course they are hackable, but we are not counting real things like money. And that was the actual quote. Wow. Wow. So, so a lot of a, uh, I think that there is a lot of education which needs to happen, but there yeah. also has to be a, a shift of attitude. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I know the, the voting village has been doing a lot to bring attention to these sorts of issues. And this year was your second year, correct? All right. Yeah. So I remember reading the report you put out in 2017 and my jaw just about hit the floor when I saw some of the findings in that report, like um, that one of the passwords for an electronic poll book was A, B, C, D, E, or that another electronic poll book that you acquired from eBay still had unencrypted personal information for over 650,000 voters stored on it. So yeah. given these sorts of findings, I mean, we've heard the some of the bad responses from public officials. Have you seen good responses as well and some people taking this stuff seriously? Yes. Uh, I would say that uh, the response is overwhelmingly positive. Uh, we, the attention, the, the, the bad answers have got a lot of the public attention, but there's a lot of good feedback and good discussions which really happen more behind the closed doors. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I, the, the response I see is overwhelmingly positive. And also, there is uh, there's an educational process. Uh, for example, our sister or yeah, sister organization, Root Asylum, in DEFCON have the kids uh, to hack a Secretary of State mock website. And the refusal was to say these websites are not realistic uh, mm -hmm. fine but at the same time a few months later a, a federal government official said well this attack was a a show off of uh, you know kind of defacing but the vulnerability underlying vulnerability that kid used that itself has been found from a number of real web websites and in the hands of malicious more skillful attacker uh, that could have been a lot more could have been done with that. that mm -hmm. attack. So the same as the voting was in vendors, refusal of uh, DEFCON was to say DEFCON was not realistic. And, you know, if, 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 if somebody would be on the election uh, day uh, popping the voting machine open, people would see that. And that's really not the point because people were, they were discovering the vulnerabilities and, and 
without even starting to think about how the discovered vulnerabilities can be weaponized and deployed in a real world environment. So uh, one thing which I, I would like to have a more rational uh, dialogue where mm -hmm. um, instead of using a cheap uh, public statement, a, a more you know, serious analysis and, and, and discussion would start in, 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 first, in both years uh, in, in that one. Our doors are open to everyone. We, we have been sending the, uh, the uh, invitations to the election system manufacturers. We have been sending the invitation to the state and, and local officials. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, uh, friends from DHS and NSA and, and, and other parts of Alphabet who always mm -hmm. welcome and always there. Uh, so it, it seems to me that the election environment is still living in the past and there's still the same paradigm, which was more 30 years ago in other industries where shooting the messenger and not understanding the, the great value uh, hacker community and security uh, research community can provide to improve security instead of dismissing and saying everything is fine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So as um, I want to follow up a little bit on what you were talking about there with the uh, with your partnership with Roots and the uh, the elections website, the mock elections website you were talking about there. So as part of this series for the Dot Citizen podcast, I had a chance to speak with the Ukrainian ambassador to the United States, Valery Chali, about uh, cyber attacks on his country's elections. And they've seen their, their telecommunication systems be targeted, including websites and TV stations hacked to display incorrect voting totals. So this 11-year-old girl at the voting village was able to hack a mock-up of Florida's elections results website within 10 minutes. So should we be concerned about voting reporting systems and not just, you know, instead of maybe just the, the voting machines? Absolutely. Uh, so the vote, the election reporting system, uh, when a uh, previously when uh, vulnerabilities in those systems have been disclosed and, and, and reported, the reviews are, are have been that, well, it doesn't matter. Those are unofficial results. You know, hack all the one, everything you want in a reporting system because they are not the real results. The problem here is that the general public doesn't know that. The general mm -hmm. public is looking that information as the most accurate information available. And also there was a recent hack in Uganda uh, where uh, there was a riot. Mm -hmm. uh, and the riots were caused by... by uh, by uh, the reporting websites being hacked and shown wrong results. The same thing you would think that in the United States, if, if you go to bed and if your reporting website gives you one winner and one set of results, the next morning when you wake up, there's completely different kind of results on, uh, in, on, on the screen that will cause, at the minimum, civil unrest mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 and so a discord into the society. An important thing here is trust. Election voting is, is the most fundamental process of democracy. Mm -hmm. And the, that whole process is relying on the trust that the elections are fair and free and fair for everyone. And the, the results are, are accurate and there's no whole play. It doesn't really matter if an actual hack has been done, if there is a perceived hack. And if there is a, a, a perceived problem, because once that undermines the trust, it undermines the, the democracy and it, and, and voter, and it, at the worst case, uh, this uh, public trust, a uh, losing of the public trust will cause voter apathy, which is equally dangerous to the, uh, to the uh, elections. Mm -hmm. I'm always saying, please, everybody who can vote, and not only vote on the top of the line, uh, top of the ballot election. There's probably 30 races on your ballot. And down in the ballot, that's where it's a $2 billion for highway and $10 billion for the whatnot. So that's mm -hmm. where the money is. And those races are massively undervoted. Uh, you can have as low as under 10% of voters casting a vote in that, even when they show up and, and vote on the top of the ballot, which means that manipulating those where the money is is scaringly 
easy. And it is not in a line, like it's not on a spotlight. It's, 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 it's very dangerous. So please vote, please vote on every race. And if you care, become a poll worker. Yeah. And participate, be, be part of the solution. Absolutely. All right, and I uh, just want to talk a little bit about some of the pushback that's come on things like the voting village. And so in some of the work that I've read on this subject, one of the things that people often bring up is that there is an inherent resiliency in the American voting system. They say that because each state does things a little bit differently, they manage elections separately and have unique systems that exist even sometimes on the county or even smaller level, that that builds in some resilience to something like a nationwide hack. Um, but do you think resiliency like this is really helpful or is it creating a false sense of security around this topic? And are there vulnerabilities there that we might not be adequately addressing? So, first of all, the statements you made have been large partly shown to be false. And let me start from the first. So first argument is to say, US elections are decentralized because every county is doing their own thing. Well, that's not exactly true because there is a hidden group of companies which are local election service companies and they are running, they are programming the voting machines for the jurisdiction. They are managing the elections for the jurisdiction. And in very many cases, the actual elected election official doesn't even understand that by using the third party company to program the voting machine and do all of that, the actual control of the election is with that company, not with the office anymore. It's very typical that any given state, you have two or three of these companies. And they, those companies might be running up, I just recently was looking uh, over one, one uh, uh, state, in that state, only under 3% of the counties were doing their own, own elections. 97% of the counties were customer of either of the two companies. And two companies were actually running 97% of the elections in that. The same thing if you look at the, the lawsuit which is going on in Georgia, it was discovered that all Georgia voting machines were programmed in one room in Kennedy University. So wow. that was completely centralized to one location. So first of all, the, the, uh, the statement of, of uh, US elections being decentralized should be re-examined and with the understanding what we know now about it. And by the way, these election service companies don't need to be certified. They are not regulated. They are typically, uh, you know, got and guys and dog in a strip mall, no security whatsoever. Their website lists all the employees, et cetera, oh et cetera, et cetera. Now, it gets even better. I was doing a public testimony in, in Concord, New Hampshire years ago, and one of the election services company people showed up and wanted to make a show. And uh, I don't remember which one of the owners of the company it was, but he made a statement saying, you don't have to worry about us hacking your elections. We have made certain that none of our employees have computer science, science degree. None <laughs> of our employees has a computer science degree. And he said that as a good thing, as we are too dumb to do. Uh, so oh my I, gosh. I, I, when I've been speaking with, uh, with this is another company, I asked them, uh, what is your churn rate? How, how your employees are hired? And I asked, well, what is your background check? Turned out that the background check was that during the few last years, they have once do a credit check for, on, a, on a prospective uh, employer. No background <laughs> check whatsoever. Wow. Uh, so, so that whole thing there is, uh, it would be very important to start to look into what are the hidden centralization. Now, the next argument is to say, well, in 2016 elections, best of our knowledge, there were 62 different make and models of voting machines used in the United States. Some of the, uh, those are really one of that. It's a one county in somewhere in the middle of, 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 of a desert 
which is using one machine and that, that nobody else is using. But the argument has been, well, you have to hack all these 52, or you know, this every device reversification is protecting. Again, no, because now it is target free environment. The elections are extremely tight now. There's the margin of victory are tight. So you don't need to hack many machines. You don't need to hack, you know, massive campaigns. And now you can look which ones are the most vulnerable machines from attacker's perspective and deploy up the opportunity. Deploy your attack where 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 the weakest link is. So again, that diversification doesn't work either. Uh, so the that all boils down to the the one thing which is audit, 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 audit. Mm -hmm. uh, Get rid of the unauditable machines, touch screens, replace everything with a paper ballot. The paper ballot itself is only useful if the evidence, the forensic evidence, when the voter marks the voter's intention on a permanent media called paper, and that paper is stored, that you have a legislation which mandates a mandatory audit every race, every time. In the United States, it's very common that the loser has to litigate and pay for the audit or recall. And of course, the winner can, uh, can use their litigation again to stop the audit or recall. That, is, that seems to me bizarre, because I'm not a US citizen, I'm, I'm looking at this as a European person. To me, it's, it's bizarre that audit is not, not uh, mandatory and, and you don't automatically take a look because if it's a landslide it's very quick risk, risk limiting audits are extremely efficient statistical means to give yourself a high level of confidence that the winner is the right winner it doesn't give you the answer is that uh, it's every vote counted exactly the right number but it gives you the high level of confidence that you have the winner who you think wins is the real winner and gives you also the general public a high level of confidence because this all process can be done at a public meeting with no special skills, no special tools needed. You, you, the process is very simple. You roll a dice, you randomly choose ballots, and you roll a dice and you randomly choose a ballot and you tally those, those randomly chosen, those chosen uh, ballots until you either meet your predefined confidence level criteria or you find out something is wrong and then you have to go to a, a full recall. Well, and just to follow up on that, uh, let's think worst case scenario here. One of the main next steps that your report mentions is the creation of a crisis communication plan. So what exactly is a crisis communication plan and what does it entail? And have any voting jurisdictions in the U.S. created a model that others might follow? So crisis communication plan here basically, for example, is if a jurisdiction finds out that their vote reporting system has been hacked. So you, you find out that information you are right now providing the general public is inaccurate. Mm -hmm. And of course, now you have a problem, you have to shut down because you cannot trust your system and you have to find an alternate way. At the time of the day, right after the con, now a DHS, best of my knowledge, DHS has started to run a tabletop exercises to train local election officials to have a communi emergency communication plan, how to deal with this kind of situation. A very important, great work. Uh, always be prepared if something goes wrong. But this is really a process which is right now starting. I'm not part of, I haven't been following uh, what is the, uh, what, what, how the DSS has been identified as best practices. But there are counties who have had similar plans a long time. And, and I was actually recently in a US election security conference where a couple of jurisdictions were telling when they have been hacked. So they actually were telling the story of when they realized that their system has been compromised and uh, I'm basically saying, oh, that was when I knew that this is going to be a long night. <laughs> so yeah. This, this is something which already has happened, but it has been happening in such an probably insignificant area that it hasn't been drawing public attention. But yes, now there is, people are now understanding the need of this and a great thing. And 
and, and please continue build that. And if you don't know how to build, there are people like our company who are happy to come to help you and, and form a plan which is suiting to that jurisdiction and conforming the local laws and, and practices. So as of this recording, we're about two weeks away from Election Day in the U.S. Early voting has already started in some states even. So what message would you give to an American voter before they cast their ballot? Well, first of all, vote. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. no, no, no matter what, please go and vote. The second thing is, if your system, which the voting method, if, if the voting method you are using is something where you can verify that the system has been recording your votes, like voter verified paper audit trace, please verify. That's what it's for. Don't mm -hmm. believe that, the, you know, if, if you have an opportunity to verify, do everything you can to verify. And if you see something, say something. If, if there's a, a, if there's a, a pro, if you think there's a problem, make sure that the election judge becomes immediately aware of, of, the, of, the, of the situation. Mm -hmm. So, yes, vote. Vote every race, not only top of the ballot. And, and, uh, and uh, very, if, if there's a method available for you to verify your vote, verify. That's great advice. And then generally, what's next in election security? What should voters look for going forward? And what should we be asking our representatives to work on? So I have there uh, only two statements and I'm, I'm, we as a security, election security community are, are uniform in this. Uh, two things is Get rid of all unauditable systems. Paper ballot is the answer. Mm -hmm. uh, things like voter verified paper audit trails or touch screen, which the print, those were thought to be good ideas 10 years ago, but those are not good ideas anymore. So paper ballot and then responsible use of technology. But don't, every voting machine we have today, every voting machine we will have 20 years from now. They all will be and are hackable. Mm -hmm. So have being, you have to use U.S. election, election flavor is uniquely uh, complex. And uh, activist community sometimes comes up and demands a, uh, that everything should be hand counted. That kind of idea comes from people. It, it can be done in smaller jurisdictions, but not in large jurisdictions. And, and people who are proposing that usually have never been handling large numbers of ballots being mm -hmm. tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of ballots. Yeah. Yeah. So you have to use technology in a responsible way. We humans have two undesirable properties. We are dishonest and error prone. So let's only use the error prone part. So we cannot really do hand count. Hand count is, a, is, is, is the last resort if you have to go and, and verify the, the, the result. So the first thing is paper ballots and second thing is mandatory audit. Mandatory audit for every race, every time. And, and familiarize yourself uh, as a local representative with a risk limiting audit. Because the argument, which usually say, well, audit will be expensive and time consuming and whatnot, there are extremely good, well documented, and many times demonstrated methods of gaining a high level of confidence with a minimal amount of work uh, to prove yourself and prove the general public that uh, the winner, winners you have, a, you have a shown are the real winners of the races and make sure public knows about it because again you have to restore the public trust and audits are a brilliant way because you can make them public meetings you can get people involved uh, it's a wonderful way of restoring the trust mm -hmm. excellent. excellent all right and Hare, one last thing uh, where can our listeners learn more about election security or your work so one of the websites, uh, if you are more from the scientific side, uh, 
uh, Verified Voting uh, is an organization which is a cross-discipline, mainly science-oriented people who have been uh, doing a research and working on this topic from multiple multidiscipline approach. Wonderful source of information, uh, which machines, what they look like, uh, how they work. Uh, we are publishing uh, stuff there. Uh, and then there are a couple of uh, other websites. The FCON website, we are publishing some material. But yes, as, as a single, if you have a single website, you, you, you want to have a, a generic information uh, on voting machines, that is verified voting. Unfortunately, uh, if you look the other areas, like the e-poll books, uh, like the voter registration system, I'm not aware of similar website or similar source where information would have been compiled about those topics. And, and that's really because the whole e-poll books uh, paradigm is so new. And again, there's no regulation. So nobody has really, best of my knowledge, and if somebody, somebody knows, let me know too. <laughs> Uh, who is compiling information about those systems and, and make it publicly available. Well, thank you, Harry, so much for taking the time to talk to us today. This has been a very enlightening conversation, and it's we're really grateful for your time today. Thank you for having me. If you enjoyed this episode of Dot Citizen, be sure to subscribe to the podcast. You can find us anywhere that podcasts are available, Google, Stitcher, iTunes, and so forth. And if you don't listen to a podcast on one of those platforms, you can also find us online at whitehatmag.com slash podcasts. That's plural, podcast with an S. You can also follow us at Dot Citizen Pod on Twitter, and be sure to send us your reactions to podcasts as well as suggestions for future episodes.